So next up uh, is a, an old friend of One Young World. This will be his third time at One Young World. Um, his name is Martin Edland. He's the CEO of an amazing organization called Malaria No More. Um, they're setting out to basically try and create a world where no single child or no person dies uh, from malaria. Since 2010, they've met, saved more than 6.2 million lives on the ground in Africa. They actually collaborate with the United Nations Foundation, who have a Nothing But Nets program. So it's all about collaboration and bringing things together. But it's a very interesting perspective that Martin has, seeing as they set out to eradicate malaria, the impact of climate uh, in that overall uh, coming together of, of one, the, the focus they have, which is to try and be the first disease ever eradicated by mobile, and two, what's going on in the world of climate. So, Martin, welcome to the stage. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me okay? So, first of all, a big thank you to David and Kate for having me for my third One Young World. Um, the first was in Johannesburg. And I asked the question there, how many people have had malaria? Let's see a raise, a show of hands. Two, one, a couple. So in Joburg, it was about a third to half of the audience. Um, so <clears throat> I realize you guys haven't had lunch yet, and I'm always wary of standing between a group of young, growing people <laughs> and lunch. Um, with David and Kate's permission, we've actually released two malaria-infected mosquitoes in the room to keep you all on your toes, so stay alert. Uh, I, I was interested to find out last night at the Biosphere, who was at the Biosphere last night? Um, I talked to, I believe his name was Tabor, one of the original Biospherians, and it turns out that malaria had a role in the early days of the Biosphere. When they were going and collecting the samples to populate the Biosphere, one of the places they went was Venezuela and they got uh, trees, you know, part of the, the rainforest there. And, and they not only came back with the trees, but someone came back, uh, one of the women who was part of the biosphere, uh, came back two weeks later and got quite ill. They took her to the hospital. They didn't know what it was. They couldn't diagnose it. Uh, she got worse and worse. And finally, the medic at the biosphere took a blood slide and looked under a microscope and saw her red blood cells ravaged by the malaria parasite. He was able to recognize it and ultimately ultimately treat her. But I think there are lots of lessons and interconnection uh, points between malaria and climate to talk about today. Um, one of those is, I know we just heard not to rely on breakthrough technologies, but one of those is a potential breakthrough technology in the malaria space. So we're at a university campus, so I want to start with a pop quiz. Which of the creatures you see on the screen poses the biggest threat to humanity? Yes, the answer is pretty obvious. Uh, but there was a polling firm that asked the US public this very same question, or a related question, what's the most, uh, the scariest animal? Here are the results. Number four, 14% of respondents said the scariest creature was a bear. Number three, 18% of respondents said the scariest creature was a shark. Uh, for some reason, they asked the follow-up question, who would win a fight between a bear and a shark? <laughs> and 56% of respondents thought the bear would win. The number two scariest creature, according to this survey, was the alligator at 19%, but fully 6% of respondents said they wanted alligators for pets. And the number one scariest creature on the planet was a snake. Now, as you've already guessed, and it's a giveaway when I come up on stage and start talking about malaria, uh, if they were better informed, they would have known that, in fact, far and away, the scariest and deadliest creature to human beings on the planet is the lowly mosquito. Responsible for about 536,000 deaths a year, dwarfing its many multiples of all the other animals you've just heard about combined. In fact, and we don't have it on the chart here, but even human beings are responsible for fewer deaths to fellow human beings each year than mosquitoes. When you count war and car crashes and crime and every other uh, man-made cause, fewer people are dying from human beings than are dying from mosquito bites. Inspired by this data, my wife and I decided to dress our young daughter, Nell, as the world's scariest creature for a recent Halloween. 
There she is, Nell the Mosquito. Terrifying, isn't she? But what is terrifying is the diseases that these tiny mosquitoes carry. Malaria is one of the world's oldest and deadliest diseases, but we're becoming increasingly familiar with many of these other ones, hearing them crop up in the news, uh, yellow fever, dengue, West Nile virus, chikungunya, and of course the news is dominated these days by Zika. Taken together, these diseases make the mosquito really our biggest threat to global health security. Uh, here's a look at, at some of the major mosquito species and, and where they are. And of course, being at a climate conference, it's worth uh, taking a moment to ask, where will they spread to? We're already hearing so many stories about uh, mosquitoes and the diseases they carry spreading to new altitudes and new latitudes uh, and infecting people as never before. On the top of the screen, what you see here is two of the, the, the two major vectors, uh, Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus, uh, that potentially carry the Zika virus. And this is their potential spread in the US. On the bottom of this slide, what you see is uh, three or four climate models looking at how temperature and precipitation may change by the year 2100. It's a lot of data to absorb quickly, but uh, red equals hot and blue equals wet. And so what you're seeing is a world that's gonna be much hotter and much wetter by the year 2100. And I suspect you all know enough about mosquitoes to know that that's ideal breeding ground for mosquitoes. When you look at the devastation caused by mosquitoes, far and away, the worst of it comes from malaria. Uh, about three billion people globally are at risk of malaria each year. Last year, there were an estimated 218 million malaria cases and 438,000 deaths per year. We've been hearing a lot about Zika and pregnancy. Uh, I talked to some uh, fellow counselors here who are pregnant and worried living here in Tucson about, about the spread of Zika. And don't get me wrong, that is a very, very scary illness if you're pregnant. Uh, my wife and I were, were pregnant, mostly her, when we were living in Senegal and sleeping under a mosquito net. And it's worth pointing out that malaria is far and away a more devastating disease during pregnancy. Fully 25% of all underweight births in Africa are a direct result of malaria, translating to about 100,000 deaths in newborns in Africa each year. So we've talked a lot about the mosquito as the face of this disease, but the real face of this disease is, of course, a human face. This is a picture that was taken on a trip I took to Nigeria, which is really the epicenter of the malaria fight. A father who arrived very early at a clinic carrying his daughter who was delirious on the verge of a coma. And the sad fact is, tragic fact, is that a child dies every two minutes from malaria. The good news, and I'm glad to say there is hopeful news, is that we're making massive global progress against this disease. So I like to say that malaria no more, uh, you know, naming yourself malaria no more, you can't settle for half measures. You can't stop halfway. We didn't call ourselves malaria 60% reduction. So we're committed to ending this disease. And last fall, I'm very proud to say that we partnered with Bill Gates and our co-founder, Ray Chambers, who's the UN Special Envoy for Malaria, to launch the first business plan to end the disease. We think in the next 25 years, we can take the world's oldest, deadliest disease and take it off the map. Now, of course, Bill Gates being Bill Gates, no sooner did he sign his name to the front of that document and we launched it, then he started saying, well, 25 years would be nice, but let's do it in 15. This inspired The Economist to put a dead mosquito on the cover of their magazine and to say, Malaria eradication by 2040 would rank among humanity's greatest achievements. Not greatest achievements in global health or development, greatest achievements, full stop. Woo. <laughs> yeah, pause for applause. <laughs> uh, so here's a, here's a look at how that may transpire. We think uh, in five year intervals, we can shrink the map so that by 2030, Malaria only remains in tropical Africa. And by 2040, we can eliminate it altogether. We've already talked about saving 6.2 million lives from this disease in the past 15 years. We can save an additional 11 million lives in the next 15 years and unlock $2 trillion in economic impact. 
We've talked a lot about how do you finance climate change. Well, ending malaria is one of the ways we could finance climate change because it would unlock so much human potential. The good news is we've got powerful supporters. Uh, President Obama at the last UN General Assembly declared malaria a moral outrage a profound injustice and urged the world to act. He followed that up a few weeks later in his State of the Union saying this can be the generation, you can be the generation to end this disease. And he put his money where his mouth is and committed an additional $200 million to the US efforts to combat malaria. Now the UK, we have lots of friends from the UK here, uh, is also a big champion. Here you're seeing George Osborne, the equivalent of the Secretary of State of the UK, writing in an op-ed, when it comes to human tragedy, no creature comes close to the devastation caused by the mosquito. And they back that up with 2.5 billion pounds in the next five years for the malaria fight. Ooh. So how do we do it? How do we end one of the world's oldest, deadliest diseases? Well, we think the malaria eradication effort can be a model for eradicating diseases in the 21st century. But it requires a whole different way of thinking about it. It requires new strategies, new tools, new financing. It requires that we learn and develop as we go. This is not a fight with a silver bullet. There isn't a single vaccine and you just need to rinse and repeat and treat everyone in the world. And I wanna focus on uh, new tools as an element of this. So <clears throat> we've seen, the good news is that the, the product development pipeline for malaria is one of the most robust of any disease. Uh, in the next five to 10 years, we're expecting to see new longer lasting bed nets, new active ingredients for insecticides, new subtler tests that can find not only full blown malaria cases, but people who, have, who are asymptomatic, who have low levels of the parasite in their body, but can still transmit the disease. And we're looking forward to what we call a single dose radical cure treatment. You take one treatment and it gets rid of the malaria in whatever stage in your body. These will be transformative. But of all of these, potentially the most transformative is how we combat the mosquito. In the last decade, we've distributed, the world has distributed more than 1 billion mosquito nets on the African continent. So each one of these protects two people. They sleep under it at night. It protects them from the Anopheles mosquito, which bites at night and transmits this disease. And mosquito nets have been a big driver in the, the 6.2 million lives saved to date in the malaria fight. Essentially, we've been playing effective defense against malaria. Wouldn't it be interesting if we could go on offense against the mosquito? In the last few years, we've discovered and harnessed the power of a revolutionary new gene editing technology called CRISPR. Anybody heard of CRISPR? Anybody know what CRISPR stands for? That's trickier, that's trickier. I won't quiz you anymore. You will all hear of CRISPR very, very soon. We actually learned about this technique from bacteria. Uh, it's something that developed in nature to allow bacteria to identify and fight invading viruses. But in human hands, CRISPR amounts to a cheap, precise, and possibly universal technology that allows us to locate, cut, and replace targeted strands of DNA. It essentially allows us to bring to gene editing the ease and accuracy that you have in a find and replace feature in your word processor. Now, it used to take students their entire dissertation and thousands of dollars to edit a single strand of DNA. Today, that can be done very, very quickly and cheaply for as little as $30. So we are literally on the verge of an era of gene editing for dummies. And of course, when that happens, you need to be sure that you're incredibly smart, careful, and responsible about how you use that technology. Now, it's tempting to immediately apply this technology and, and try to address a whole range of diseases and conditions that afflict humanity. But the biggest concerns that people have, and they're really energetic uh, ethical debates about this, is they're concerned about making any ch uh, changes that are heritable in human beings. So creating a change that you'd pass on to subsequent generations. And frankly, we should talk a lot more about that before we move ahead. But what if you could save 
millions or tens of millions of lives around the world without touching the human genome? What if you could end malaria? In the last year alone, we've seen proof of concept of two approaches uh, that could do just that in the malaria fight. The first out of UC Irvine is an approach where they've added a gene that produces antibodies and actually as a, as a female Anopheles mosquito has a blood meal, these enzymes come out and they bond with the parasite and they halt the further development of malaria. So essentially we're short circuiting malaria at the moment that the mosquito has its blood meal. The second approach represented on the right is a bit more radical. Uh, out of Imperial College in London, uh, they've actually uh, added genes that create sterile female mosquitoes, uh, creating the prospect of crashing the mosquito population. Now, many of you may be thinking, that's not enough. You can't just edit the genome of a few mosquitoes. Uh, so how do you actually get this to permeate within the mosquito population? CRISPR, once again, holds a potential answer. Uh, through uh, an approach that, that's being called gene drive, you can actually ensure that a trait on one chromosome copies itself into its partner and in every case so that all the offspring carry the desired trait. So on top here, what we're seeing is normal inheritance where only 50% of offspring would carry the desired trait. And below, with gene drive, you can ensure that almost 100% of offspring carry this desired trait. So if you were to take one of the examples we just described and create a recessive gene for infertile females, you could suddenly create an entire population with that. And as uh, mates, uh, both with recessive genes, started to come together, you'd see a crash in the mosquito population. So I point this out uh, as something that hasn't arrived yet. You know, we're five or more years away from seeing this move from academic literature into, into the real world. But it is an example of a breakthrough technology that could utterly transform how we combat one of the world's oldest, deadliest diseases. And certainly that has to hold some inspiration and some relevance as we grapple with other massive intractable problems like some of the technology problems that we're describing here today at a conference on the environment and climate. But as David and Kate have so consistently and eloquently said, this is all about action. So I would be remiss if I didn't leave you with some way to take action right now. So. Uh, as David said, we partner with the UN Foundation and their Nothing But Nets campaign. We also work with USAID and Stephen Curry. Any Warriors fans out there? I'm one. And we launched something called Call Your Shot. Uh, one Young World has already been supporting this. It's essentially like an ice bucket challenge. You go out and film yourself taking a trick shot. You donate a bed net and you challenge other people to do it. We have a little highlight reel of some of the shots so far. So let's roll that. Hey, I'm Stephen Curry. We have the rights as a college human. I'm Breck Shea. Hi, I'm Cheryl Sandberg. Hi, I'm Nick Harmer from Death Cap for Cutie. Yeah. We're calling our shot to the people area. I'm glad that I'm not the only one who finds Nell that cute. That was my daughter at the end. So in summary, call your shot, help contribute to this. You will be the generation to end one of the world's oldest, deadliest diseases, and that will be one of humanity's greatest achievements. Thanks for what you're already doing. Thanks for what you will do to end this disease.